Welcome to the Trinity's Podcast, where we explore theories about the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Do you love God enough to think about Him? Episode 130, Ehrman and Bird on How Jesus Became God, Part 3. Originally, when I decided to comment on this debate, I thought I could fit it into one episode. Well, that was foolish. There was so much substance to the debate on both sides that it took two just to cover the debate. Then I realized that this Greer Heard Point Counterpoint Forum, which, by the way, you should check out their website and their previous events. I have a link for that on the blog post for this episode. I realized that they had also posted a video with all of the speakers from this year, six different people which included some more discussion by Ehrman and Bird. So I thought I'd give you the highlights of that as well. The first questioner asks Dr. Ehrman that if the authors of the Gospels believe that Jesus is the Son of Man spoken of in Daniel, that we looked at last time, and in Second Temple Judaism they believed that Son of Man to be a pre-existent figure, that is, somebody who existed before his human life, And how could it be that the authors of the Gospels don't believe that Jesus existed before his human conception? Here's a part of Dr. Ehrman's answer. I don't think Second Temple Judaism had a belief about anything. There were Jews who thought that the Son of Man was a being who was pre-existent. There were other Jews who thought the Son of Man was somebody who was made the Son of Man. So, for example, in the book of First Enoch, Enoch becomes the Son of Man. He wasn't always the Son of Man. He becomes the Son of Man in 1st Enoch. In Christian thinking, Jesus became the Son of Man. And so for Matthew and Luke, uh, he became the Son of Man. All you need to do is read Matthew and Luke's birth narratives. It's pretty clear. Um, Luke Luke especially, when Jesus uh, is conceived by Mary, when the Holy Spirit makes Mary pregnant, that's when Jesus comes into existence. There's not a word about his pre-existence. Another panelist decides to chime in as well with something to add. This is Dr. Larry Hurtado. I had the privilege of interviewing him for episodes 99 and 100 of the Trinity's podcast. He's at the University of Edinburgh and is very well known for his work on early Christianity. This is part of his answer. I agree with Bart that uh, unlike uh, Simon, perhaps, I agree. I don't think that there is explicit, any explicit evidence of an emphasis in any of the synoptics that Jesus is pre-existent. It's fairly explicit in the Gospel of John. I don't find anything equivalent in explicit or foregrounding of any such idea in the synoptics. It's another question then, did the authors themselves believe it or not? It seems to me it's a non sequitur to draw a conclusion from one to the other, but if we go simply by the text and say, were the authors interested in presenting that as a part of their story of Jesus? In my view, clearly not. One thing I wish that somebody had mentioned is the idea of ideal or notional pre-existence. This was discussed by Dr. Dustin Smith in podcasts number 61 and 62. And you see this even in post-biblical authors like Tertullian. They think of things that really do come into existence as having already, quote, existed in God's mind. Now, that's not literal, real pre-existence, but it's something that sounds a lot like it. So for people who believe that the Messiah or the Son of Man pre-existed, so to speak, is that what they meant? If that's what they meant, this is not the sort of thing that gets later Christian theologians so excited. Is it a non sequitur, that is, a fallacious argument, to say that the authors of the synoptics don't mention Jesus' pre-existence, therefore they don't believe in it? Well, like I discussed last time, that depends on whether or not this is true. They would have mentioned it, had they believed it. Suppose that the author of Mark believed that Jesus pre-existed in the sense that God foreknew him. In that case, it would make sense if this author just never mentioned it. He might assume that everything pre-existed in that sense. Everything that comes into existence, so to speak, was already foreknown. Or he might think that just some important things like the Torah and the Messiah, things which were predestined, were foreknown. So if it's just notional or ideal pre-existence, which isn't really pre-existence at all, it's just foreknowledge, yeah, then it wouldn't be a surprise at all that the author of Mark didn't mention that. But if he meant real pre-existence, 
That would be astounding. If I knew, or even knew about, a man who was more than a thousand years old, that's the first thing I would tell you about him. If I knew a man who was more than a million years old, or who I knew to pre-exist creation, that's one of the first things I would tell you about him for sure. So if it's real pre-existence, as in Jesus existed as a self, as an intelligent agent, although not yet a human, if that's what we're talking about, then it's highly plausible that if this author had believed that, then he would have mentioned it. And so then we're not dealing with a fallacy at all. The Simon he mentioned there is Dr. Simon Gathercole, who's sitting right next to him. This is the author of the book, The Pre-Existent Son, Recovering the Christologies of Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And Dr. Hurtado, like a number of other scholars, including James Dunn, who reviewed Gathercole's book, just disagree with him. They don't agree that it's part of the content that's taught in those Gospels that Jesus pre-existed. They're not explicitly denying it, but they're not explicitly affirming it either, or even deliberately implying it. Dr. Gathercole thinks that they are. We'll hear a little bit from Dr. Gathercole later in this podcast. The next questioner asks the panel whether, in the Gospel of Mark, when Jesus walks on water, forgives sins, or claims to be the Lord of the Sabbath, isn't the author of Mark, the questioner asks, suggesting that Jesus just is the God of Israel himself? I think he's definitely edging in that category. If you just treat the dynamics of the story on its own, and what they say is, who can forgive sins but God alone? Thus, by forgiving sins and claiming he's the authority to do so, it, it, it does edge towards that direction. Now, the idea of getting your in sins forgiven by a human being made sense as long as you're a priest and you're in the temple. You could offer the sacrifice and the, and the priest could pronounce absolution or the efficacy of the sacrifice. But this seems to be independent of that. So Jesus is kind of offering this uh, temple forgiveness, but independent of the, of the normal institution. And if you look at the dynamics of the Mark and story, it seems Mark at least takes it in that sense that this is a, a claim to offer something that God was known to forgive. Now, there may be cases in other places where humans can forgive sins. There is a text in the Dead Sea Scrolls. It's a bit fragmented about a, a Jewish exodus, uh, exorcist forgave my sins. There may be something like that going around. But the dynamics of the story itself, in its Mark and context, that certainly suggests that Mark thinks that Jesus is usurping a divine prerogative for himself. First thing he does is kind of hedges bets and suggests the story is edgy in that direction. But we have a competent author here. He's either implying that or he's not. Which is it? He can't kind of sort of be doing it and not doing it. Now, about this objection from the onlookers in Mark 2, who can forgive sins but God alone, this is surely relevant, but don't stop there. The very next verse, Jesus knew what they were thinking in their hearts and says, why are you thinking these things? Which is easier to say to this paralyzed man, your sins are forgiven, or get up, take your mat, and walk. But I want you to know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. And so then... He tells the man to get up, take his mat, and go home, and he's healed. What is he doing? Is he saying that he's doing something only God can do? No, he's, he's saying, I do have the authority to do these things. I can forgive, and I can also heal. And so that you know that I have this authority, I'm going to heal the guy right now. And then he does it. He doesn't say, yes, that's right, only God can forgive sins, but I am God. He says, I'm going to show you that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. Surely, the reader is to think that God has given him this authority. It's interesting how the author of Matthew expands this story. In Matthew 9, the story ends like this. And he, that is the paralyzed man, he stood up and went to his home. When the crowd saw it, they were filled with awe, and they glorified God who had given such authority to human beings. Just in case you were going to make the mistake of thinking in that incident that he's implicitly claiming to be God, well, Matthew helps you out. I don't think he really needed to help you out. When Jesus calls himself the Son of Man, he's already thereby distinguished himself from God. As we heard in Daniel last time, a one like a Son of Man comes into God's throne room and is awarded with all these honors, 
He's given these things by God. About forgiveness in the temple, how is that relevant to this? Jesus later turns around and gives his followers authority to forgive sins. Jesus says in John 20, 23, If you forgive anyone's sins, their sins are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. Some people want to say that, no, this is just pronouncing forgiveness. It's not giving forgiveness. I don't see why it can't be giving forgiveness. If I'm the holder of a debt, I can send you as my agent to announce that I've forgiven someone their debt. I can also tell you as my agent that you can just release them of the debt if they seem really sorry about it and really sad. I might say, if they're going to be a jerk about it, no, I'm not going to pay you, then hand in the bill and say it's due next week. But if they say, hey, I'm really sorry, but I'm, I've fallen on hard times, I'm having trouble taking care of my family, I might tell you as my agent, if they're really sorry about it, go ahead and forgive the debt. I can authorize you to forgive the debt. And if you do it, it's me who's done it. I've done it through you because I really did give you that power. To sum up, like we saw last time, be careful if you're going to agree with Jesus' Jewish opponents. You do that to your own peril. They're not always wrong, but frequently they're missing the point. As Dr. Ehrman pointed out last time, in Mark in particular, Jesus is a misunderstood character by many people through a lot of the book. Here, they're just not willing to see, they're not willing to believe that he's been given the authority to forgive sins. So he proves that he does have divine authority by healing. At this point, Dr. Jennifer Wright Knust jumps into the discussion. She's a professor at the Boston University School of Theology, and she makes the general point that you have to read something like the Gospel according to Mark as theology and not just purely as a work of history. And then Dr. Michael Bird chimes in with this question. Jennifer, in terms of Mark's story, I mean, bracketing out the historical Jesus element, do you think that the Mark and Jesus is being portrayed as one with divine prerogatives in forgiving this man's sin? Is, 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 is that what makes sense of the Mark and story? Mark might well be doing that, and I, I think Mark does think that Jesus can do that. And one of the reasons why Mark presents that as a controversial thing for Jesus to do is because Mark, or the writer of Mark, let's not call him Mark, that is controversial that the followers of Jesus are going around claiming that Jesus can forgive sins. And so he, he can easily see that happen in the story of Jesus as well. So yes, Mark thinks that. What Jesus did is a whole other question. What has she agreed to, though? He has divine prerogatives? One interpretation is that in Mark, Jesus is a man, the human Messiah, whom God has given the authority to do things that otherwise only God would be able to do. But that's not what Dr. Bird is suggesting. He's suggesting that Jesus is doing things that only God can do. Big difference. I think she agreed to the first, but I'm not sure. Another questioner asks Dr. Knus to re-ask something that apparently she asked in an earlier session to Dr. Bird. And this results in an interesting exchange the benefit for confessional Christians of pushing the moment of Jesus's divinity or the recognition of Jesus's divinity into Jesus himself like what you know because we still can't prove the Nicene Creed you know so how have we really helped our historiographical problem as confessional Christians and why not just admit we can't do it and then rather think about whether we think a particular post-critical history is a good interpretation, a valid interpretation of the evidence. We can argue that. We can, that's what history, historians do. They argue, is this a valid interpretation of the evidence? I guess I just don't understand the desire to push it back as much as I want to. I just really don't. That's a good question. In one sense, I don't need Jesus to believe about himself everything that later Christians attributed to him. 
I can believe that Jesus is the Prince of Peace without him ever claiming to have been the Prince of Peace. I can believe Jesus loves the little children or the children of the world without him ever explicitly making that statement about himself. Uh, and so in, in one sense, I don't feel the need to m move a center of gravity earlier. What I'm really uh, interested in is given the various sayings attributed to Jesus, given his actions, given the way the evangelists have constructed their narratives, given what the early, how the early church's beliefs about Jesus, widespread diversity they, de they developed, what is the best way in which what we can summarize Jesus' identity as it was perceived by his peers and what can be inferred from his actions and sayings? So for me, it's, it's more of the quest of, or to answer that question that Jesus poses to us in every age, who do you say I am? So you're looking a little confused, so have I not answered it? I am a confessional Christian, and I kind of like Bart's story better, you know? And, and I, I'm trying to understand that, and I, I do think that, um, I think we have effective attachments to different stories. And I'm not exactly sure why, and I probably need to think about it some more. But I think that, the, but that Bart's emphasis on the humanity of Jesus and his followers and the brokenness of his followers after his death, I find that a deeply meaningful reading of those events. And since I don't see history as a challenge to my faith, I'm free to resonate with different historical stories. I can examine history to see what's valid, right? And, I, and I'm trained to do that, and I can make an argument about what I think valid, a valid reading of the evidence is. But I'm also interested in what readings of history are valuable, and valuable in what ways. And so I'm not disagreeing with, with your historiography or anything. I'm just saying that I'm attracted to this other story. And I think it has something to do with my own sense of brokenness in the human condition. That was a really strange exchange. Let me see if I can paraphrase what just happened. She said that she's a confessional Christian, so I take it she's a kind of mainline Christian, maybe not an evangelical, but wants to be traditional in her belief. And I don't know what her denominational background is, but I take it that her idea is, what do we believe about Jesus and God? Well, look, we have the Creed of Constantinople. We have the Council of Chalcedon in 451. What else do you need? What benefit is there in trying to prove the deity of Christ or the triune nature of God, for instance? I'm just guessing what she has in mind, of course. What benefit is there to trying to get those things out of the Bible? Well, she's talking to an evangelical Protestant. Again, I don't know that much about Dr. Bird, but I assume that as an evangelical, he thinks that the apostolic writings are divinely inspired and that Christian belief and practice are to be grounded in those writings, and that later formulations are to be judged as to whether they really do accurately summarize and express what's taught in the apostolic sources. So, her question strikes me as bizarre when you're knowingly talking to an evangelical Protestant. Maybe the Reformation is just really dead. The rebellion against later Catholic elaborations and contradictions of earlier belief and practice, the rebellion against that is just long dead, and it doesn't occur to her that someone should want to ground their belief not only in later tradition, but also in the sources. Dr. Bird, in reply, wants to emphasize that he's not taking a naive view that everything that's a part of Christian faith has to be in, for instance, the Gospel of Mark and seems to even leave the door open to the idea that Jesus is limited in knowledge. And then she comes back and basically says that Dr. Ehrman's story appeals to her more, not because she thinks that it's true, although maybe she thinks that, but because it resonates with her. And she basically says that she's going to compartmentalize her historical thinking from her theology, and so then she doesn't have to worry about history-based objections to her beliefs about Jesus. She can just then proceed to form those beliefs by responding kind of in an emotional level to various ways of understanding Jesus or describing Jesus. Now, of course, certain religious stories and religious beliefs have social and psychological values. Story might help you sleep better at night. It might help you get along with your family better if you tell a story or believe a story. 
But of course, the main value of Christian tradition is supposed to be that it's true. And that seems to be the value that she's setting aside if she's willing to agree with Dr. Ehrman that the fourth gospel contradicts the first three about Jesus. Well, somebody's then getting it badly wrong. Now, if that's where the evidence points, that's where the evidence points. Although, as I explained two episodes ago, it seems to me there's room to argue that the four Gospels basically are consistent about God and Jesus. Next, someone in the audience asks a very general question, how do you know what's true, and how do you decide if the Bible is reliable or not? He asked this question of Dr. Dale Martin, who is a professor of religious studies at Yale University. Here's part of his answer. I believe theology should be an empirical science. By that, I don't mean that God is empirically observable or verifiable, but what I think theology is is second-order description of what we say we believe and do. It's, it's art and toward ritual also and ethics. But what I try to do is say, what is it that I keep saying I believe? And every week it's the Nicene Creed when I go to Mass at my nice high Anglo-Catholic Episcopal Church. If I'm going to morning prayer or evening prayer, we say the Apostles' Creed every time. Now, I've been saying Jesus descended into hell for about my whole life. Well, I don't believe that there's a physical space like ancient people did believe under our feet where it's called hell. So what am I doing when I say Jesus descended into hell? And then I try to unpack that. So for example, I'll say it's a true statement to me because I believe it teaches us that we can never be anywhere where Jesus is not or something like that. Wow, that's a radical reconception of what theology is all about. On the face of it, theology is supposed to be a discipline of human investigation where the subject matter is God. Theology is the attempt to gain knowledge of God or understanding of God. He's redefining theology to be, I guess, kind of a branch of social science, sociology and or psychology, and it focuses on what sorts of things people confess. And then he comes up with a kind of reinterpretation of the traditional confession that Jesus descended to hell or to the underworld between his death and resurrection. All I can say about this is there is a radical cultural gap between a lot of theologians and a lot of ordinary Christians. And it's a gap that's produced by philosophy slash ideology that's accepted in some academic circles. I guess in some circles you can get away with saying that theology is really just an empirical social science or a branch of one or more of the social sciences. I don't think that's right. That's not what I think theology is. Social science is great, but it ain't theology. Then Dr. Martin gets into some epistemology. Uh, my epistemology is recognizing that observing something is never a surefire way of getting to the truth because we always make mistakes when we observe things but we should constantly try to see things as they are and theology is based on seeing our own faith as it is seeing what we do and then try to show how that's a rational thing it may not be true but it's at least rational so i'm very much an empiricist but an empiricist with a small e in the sense that i don't think empiricism is is a reliable always way to come to knowledge it's just the best one i think we have so theology for me is observing what actual christians say and do and then trying to make sense of it so we're supposed to look at what actual christians think and then see if there's some story that can be told about how that's rational what they believe sounds like a kind of apologetics but all just from the insider's perspective I mean, if we're concerned with having true beliefs, how can we rule out of court objections that don't presuppose Christian belief and practice? And why are we trying to come up with a story about how these beliefs are rational or could be rational 
Isn't that because we want to get true beliefs and avoid false beliefs? But if we're admitting that truth is important, if we haven't decided that truth is something that can't ever be got, it can't ever be found, if we think truth is important, I don't see how we can only stay within the psychological perspective of the believer. Any thorough apologetics, it seems to me, has to go beyond that. Any thorough theology, it seems to me, has got to go beyond that. Maybe I'm not entirely understanding where Dr. Martin is coming from. Dr. Larry Hurtado then jumps in and makes the point that it's one thing to make an argument to insiders, to people who share your religious presuppositions, and it's another thing to make an argument to outsiders. If you're going to do that, you have to try to operate from premises that they also will accept. This is a very good point. And then Dr. Simon Gathercole jumps in. For me, it's partly a question of trying to grasp what the apostolic gospel is, which I don't think is a, an unreachable, I think that's probably somewhat an area where we disagree on the panel, but I, I, don't, I, I think that that is something that is attainable, an understanding of that. And that one puts that in conjunction with what one received um, from others as well. Um, so the gospel as we heard it preached to us. Yes, Protestantism is not entirely dead. Well said, Dr. Gathercole. Dr. Dale Martin then chimes in, and remember, he's a Protestant, but he's an Episcopalian, and he says, in part, I completely agree with that. I believe the center of Christianity is not Scripture necessarily, it's the Gospel. And Scripture exists to give us the Gospel. You can't ever define once and for all what the Gospel is, because it's a constant retelling of what God did in Jesus Christ. But one of the things that we have to admit is that, and this is hard for Protestants to admit, all of us got the Gospel from the Church in some form or another. And when epistemology, when it really comes down to it, it's you got to trust the church. You must have been uh, in my lecture yesterday because that's exactly what I said. The, the center boundary and integrating for our faith is the gospel and we received it from the church, our mother. Well, sure. But what is the church? Is the church the group of people who function and operate under the actual leadership and headship of the risen and exalted Christ? That's one thing. Or is the church anybody who is within the historical, sociological mainstream of the small c Catholic movement? That movement which includes the Roman Catholic Church, the Eastern Orthodox Church, and at least many or most Protestants. With other groups more on the margins, the Anabaptists for instance, or the Pentecostals, I do think we have to trust the testimony of God's people. I don't think everybody in the small c Catholic movement is one of God's people. And as a Protestant, I have to say, as the Christian and Protestant panelists have to say, that the mainstream movement went very wrong on certain things, and so needs to be trusted, but not too much, and not when they go against the teaching of Jesus' own apostles. Another questioner asks kind of a wandering and diffuse question, but his point was mainly to Dr. Knust and he asked her, if Jesus didn't really claim to be divine, what then is the value of believing that he's divine? Or maybe it's, how can we be reasonable in thinking that he was divine if he did not claim that about himself? I wouldn't suggest that we need historical truth to validate the Christian claim of the resurrection and the continuing presence of God in the world. In fact, I would agree with my students who suspect that history can be used to argue against that truth if a historian so desires. I would also suggest to my students that that problem will not be solved by trying to find a historically valid claim of Jesus's divinity in the Gospels, that claim is not available through historical method. So I think I would side with Dale, actually, and the way he ended his talk, that the possibility of life after death and the conviction that that possibility is real is a way of living. It's not a historical, scientific point. <laughs> I guess I would say that I could evaluate Professor Bird's argument for 
Jesus' self-understanding as a historical argument within the realm of historiography, and we could have that conversation. I could also evaluate Bart's stor historical analysis, but for me at this moment, <laughs> given that I've, how I've situated myself in this panel, to me more interesting is the value of one historical analysis over another, since all they can be is competitively plausible historical analyses. They cannot encapsulate truth. Now, this is an interesting answer. Honestly, I hear some bad philosophy coming through. It sounds to me like she's confusing the idea of truth with the idea of certainty. And she's saying that we can't know the truth about the historical Jesus. Well, why not? We know the truth all the time when we're not certain about it. I'm not certain that I had cereal for breakfast this morning, but I would say that I know that it's true. She seems to think that historical inquiry and historical arguments are never going to deliver certainty, and so therefore they're to just be set aside and ignored. This seems to me like quite a mistake, and I don't see how we can ignore historical questions. But she seems to be presupposing a philosophy that philosophers of religion call religious non-realism. And this is the view that the value of religion does not mainly or only lie in the truth of its claims. Rather, the value of religion is its social function, what it does for families, or what it does for your psychological well-being, or something like that. Now, earlier she said she was a confessional Christian. I assume that that meant that she believes the central Christian teachings, say the contents of the Apostles' Creed, or maybe that in the Nicene Creed, or something like that. Of course, to believe something is to believe that it's true. That's just what belief is. You're committing to reality being a certain way. Now, if you're a religious anti-realist or a non-realist, what you're going to do is just decide to go along with all the religious statements, with the prayers, the songs, you'll enjoy the sermons on kind of an emotional level, and you just won't trouble yourself about whether it's true. And so you don't think that believing it is the point. You don't think that believing it is important. You don't think that having true religious beliefs is important. I could be wrong, but it sounds to me like that's what she's saying. Well, I just disagree. I think that to be a Christian, to be a follower of Christ, you have to believe in God. You have to believe that Jesus is God's Messiah and that God raised him from the dead and that he's now active in the world through his believers. Plausibility is how we live our lives. We very rarely have certainty, absolute certainty about anything. Why would it be any different in matters of religion? A lot of people have a common sense idea, modern people, that if Jesus didn't know he was divine, then we can't worship him as divine. If he didn't know he was divine, because of course he wouldn't be God. If he was God, he would have omniscience. But even theologically, I think people need more theological education even as much as they need more historical education. There's been a history of the doctrine of kenosis that goes way back in history. A lot of Christian theologians have always said when Jesus gave up his full divinity to become fully man, he had to give up some of his divine prerogatives, and one of those things could be omniscience. We don't have to imagine Jesus as walking around with a divine consciousness of his own status. And we even can use a very traditional Christian teaching of kenosis. Kenosis comes from the Greek word for emptying. Christian theologians have always said, a lot of them have said, the human Jesus did not need to know he was divine in order for us still to worship him as divine. And that's been defended as a Christian doctrine for centuries. I was really surprised by that answer, and I expected one of the other panelists to bust him out on it. As far as I know, this kenosis theory, this kenosis approach to Christology, only goes back to the 1800s to certain British and German theologians, then American theologians. If you want to read about the 19th century origins of this kenosis approach to Christology, there's a good discussion of it in a book by John Hick. And I have the link to that on this blog post as well. I have not found ancient people saying that Jesus gave up his divine attributes to become incarnate. In the early days of Christianity, namely in the second half of the 100s, when the Logos theory was starting to become popular, at least among certain intellectual elites, 
they thought that the pre-existent Jesus, that the Logos, the Word of John 1, was, yes, divine in a sense, but not in the same sense as the Father. And so they didn't need to say, and did not say, that the Logos has all the divine attributes. In fact, once in a while, they explicitly deny that. So Irenaeus, in his book Against Heresies, Book 2, Chapter 28, Section 6, and Section 8, Irenaeus just agrees with Mark 13, 32, that the Son does not know the day or the hour of his return, but only the Father. He also cites John 14, 28, where Jesus says, The Father is greater than I. And he doesn't qualify that as so many later theologians would, going on to say that the Father is greater than the Son's human nature, but not greater than the Son's divine nature, or that the Father is greater than the Son as human, but not greater than the Son as divine. No, he just says straight up, the Father is greater than I. And his idea is that one respect in which God is greater is that God knows more than the Son of God. So early mainstream Christian theologians just weren't worried by the evident non-omniscience of Jesus in the New Testament. Later on, when you're getting closer to the time of the Council of Constantinople in 381, now they're asserting that Jesus is divine so as to make him true God from true God, and then they are starting to assume that it makes him have all the divine attributes. Now that they're ascribing full-blown deity to Jesus, the kind of deity that the one true God has, which obviously must include omniscience, now they're very worried. What they don't do is focus on the form of the word kenosis, which is in Philippians chapter 2, where Paul says that Christ emptied himself. They don't suggest that Christ lost his omniscience or gave up the use of it or anything like that. What do they say? Well, they scramble around in several different directions. I shouldn't go into them now, but if you're curious about what they say, there are two links on the blog post for this episode to papers by other people who discuss these late patristic strategies for dealing with Jesus' apparent non-omniscience. I mean, generally speaking, they're asserting that, yes, he really is omniscient, or his divine nature is, maybe he's just pretending, that sort of thing. Another point is that you can't give up an essential attribute so a lot of these emptying theories, these kenosis theories, think that Jesus rather lay aside not omniscience, but the exercise of his power of omniscience or something like that. Realizing this, some very smart and accomplished recent evangelical analytic philosophers like Stephen T. Davis and Stephen Evans, they suggest that based on the doctrine of incarnation, we need to carefully reconsider the divine attributes. They suggest that omniscience is not an essential attribute of God. What is essential is something like being omniscient unless one has freely decided to become incarnate to save humanity. That kind of conditional, complicated property, they suggest, is what's really essential. You could have that property and be non-omniscient for a while. But of course, if it's omniscience that's essential to you, you must be omniscient at every point at which you exist. That's what it means for omniscience to be an essential property. As far as I know, mainstream Christianity has not always taught kenosis theory. As far as I know, it's misleading to say that kenosis theory has been taught for centuries or to suggest that it's been taught since the beginning. It was in the 19th century that theologians again started to think that it was important that Jesus should have a more typically human point of view. And then also some began to theorize about maybe he's got two minds and one's omniscient, and one's not omniscient. But that's another story for another day. When the Trinity's podcast returns, some closing statements from the panelists. <laughs> 
when the audience had run out of questions, they then passed the microphone down the line and gave each person a couple of minutes to say their final piece. Here's some of what they said. And for sake of time, I'm not going to include all the comments. My basic case in my book, How Jesus Became God, and that I presented last night, is as follows. I don't think that Jesus himself called himself God during his public ministry. I personally don't think Jesus imagined he was God. He wasn't God. He was God's prophet. He was the one God had sent to proclaim the coming kingdom of God that was soon to arrive within Jesus' own generation. Jesus was not calling himself God. Certainly his disciples did not think he was God during his life. They couldn't even figure out how he could be the Messiah during his life. They were, in the Gospels at least, especially in Mark's Gospel, our first account, they were clueless. And yet, later they came to say that Jesus in some sense was divine. Why is that? Because they came to believe that Jesus had been raised from the dead. Their belief in the resurrection is what led to their understanding that Jesus was God. Without the resurrection, that would not have happened. If Jesus had died and simply disappeared, nobody would have thought he was God. The turning point was the belief in the resurrection, which came because some of the followers of Jesus saw him afterwards, or at least they believed they saw him afterwards. But they knew he wasn't still there with them. Well, if he came back from the dead, where is he? He's up in heaven. What happens when a person's taken up to heaven? What do they become? They become a divine being. The earliest Christians thought Jesus became a divine being at the resurrection. And once they started thinking that, they started thinking more and more. And eventually they started thinking that Jesus was God, that Jesus had always been God. And eventually they came to say that Jesus was the God who uh, was the creator of the world and that he was one with God the Father. Those are later developments. They're not what Jesus thought and not what his disciples thought during his lifetime. First, let me congratulate Bart uh, for uh, seconding and making much more widely known some points of view that I've been articulating since 1988. I agree entirely. The historical Jesus did not say that he was divine, did not demand worship. The reason that early Christians treated him as divine, uh, early Jewish believers treated him as divine and worshipped him was because they believed that God had exalted him to heaven and glory and now required him to be treated that way. The Christological claims of the New Testament and the devotional practice of the New Testament are heavily focused on Jesus, but they have a fundamentally theocentric basis. They believe that God had done certain things, raising, exalting, confirming, and conferring upon Jesus curioship, and now required him to be worshipped. So uh, in that kind of perspective, I think we're, we're very much uh, in agreement. And uh, Bart has a standing invitation also, of course, as I indicated sometime earlier, to Sup with us at the early high Christology club, since he clearly believes that. As I recall, you agree also that this eruption of treating Jesus as in some sense sharing a divine glory really begins in the Jewish homeland among circles of, of Jewish believers probably in, in, in Jerusalem, and not a later incremental development. I don't think there that Dr. Hurtado is at all being sarcastic. This brings out an important point. I think a lot of evangelical consumers of scholarship consider the early High Christology Club to be a champion of orthodoxy. What they're opposing, though, is just uh, this long incremental view where Christian belief kind of evolves and the worship of Jesus comes later once Gentiles have come into the church and it wasn't there at the beginning. That's what they're against. Dr. Hurtado and others, and now Dr. Ehrman too, are saying, no, Jesus was worshipped right at the first, right after the resurrection. And yet, Dr. Hurtado is clear that his point is not that they thought Jesus was God himself, and his point is not that the disciples thought that Jesus was God himself. Rather, they thought God had raised and exalted him, and so out of obedience to God, that's why they worshipped him. Now, is this consistent with the later traditions that Jesus has two natures, that he's one Usia with the Father? Well, that's a ticklish question, isn't it? He's not championing 4th century Catholic orthodoxy. What he's championing is a straight-up reading of the New Testament, which features the worship of Jesus, to, as Paul says in Philippians 2, the glory of God. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. As a result, 
God exalted him and gave him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. If Bart Ehrman can be a member of the High Christology Club, then the Christology isn't all that high. The 16th century Unitarian Socinus thought that Jesus could be and should be worshipped. Moving on. In his closing statement, Dr. Hurtado makes a really interesting point. Just a couple of comments on what we've been talking about, about the Jesus God thing. There's a really good little book uh, by Jonathan Z. Smith called Drudgery Divine. One of the points that I recall is that he, he noted how in the Enlightenment period, certain deist thinkers made a very clever move. They borrowed a tactic from Protestant Reformation, which was to draw a line between the New Testament, what the New Testament said, and what the church said. And the Protestant argument was, if it ain't in the New Testament, then the church has no basis for teaching it. And so they, they drew this very strict line. And what the deist philosophers did was to make a similar move, and their argument was, if Jesus didn't say it, then uh, it's no good, even if it's in the New Testament. So for Protestants, the sacred period was the New Testament, and after that, everything went to hell. And as far as the deists were concerned, Jesus was the authoritative spokesman, and after that, pretty much everything went to hell. The classic divide between Jesus and Paul and so on went on. So they're the ones who basically said, Jesus is a good guy, and what he said was true. What the New Testament says about him is a declension. That introduced, as Schweitzer, Albert Schweitzer pointed out, that introduced the whole motivation for the whole historical Jesus enterprise. Because if Jesus is the arbiter of all Christian faith, then the key question is, what the devil did he say and what the devil did he do? And the amazing thing about the deist move is that they sold that idea to all sides in the debate. So that thereafter, practically the whole historical uh, critical enterprise, conservative or liberal or whatever, was Jesus said this, no, he said this. Nobody ever stopped to say, hold on a minute, who the devil says that Jesus had to say it in order for it to be true, when if you go through the New Testament writings, the major statement that is made time and again is that God has raised Jesus from the dead, God has conferred upon him glory, and God has exalted him and now requires, as in Philippians 2, that he be reverenced accordingly. So uh, again, I, th I think I want to agree with my colleagues there. There are sound exegetical, historical, and theological and philosophical reasons for rejecting this sort of dubious notion that unless Jesus said he was this or that, it's invalid. At the risk of being slightly provocative, go back to a statement from Rudolf Bultmann. Jesus could have been dragged kicking and screaming to his death, and it would still be valid in principle to reverence him as the divine son of God because God raised him from the dead and now requires him to be treated that way. It is fundamentally what God says about Jesus that is the case, not what Jesus says about himself. Well said. A Christian can't consistently take this deistic line. A Christian thinks that God sent Jesus, and he also thinks that God empowered Jesus to effectively teach his apostles, and that God continued to empower the apostles. It's always been a part of Christian belief and practice that certain very important things were not taught and practiced by the Lord Jesus. Jesus was a law keeper. He had to be. It was required of him as a Jew. According to Acts, God guided the apostles towards a faith that a Gentile could convert to without being a law keeper, that is, without keeping the law of Moses. That's Christianity. Next, Dr. Gathercole. I guess I'm, I'm left with a sort of lingering question about what I'll call the tunnel period. I think British New Testament scholars have often called the time between the first Easter and, say, th let's say 30, and the time of our earliest New Testament documents, say, let's say 50, uh, 18 or 20 years, as the tunnel period. The reason it's called the tunnel period is because it's dark and we, don't, we, you, we can't see what's in it. And so I'm not sure that it's with great confidence that we can reconstruct how the first Christians came to re regard Jesus as, uh, as divine. We can tell certain stories, but in terms of the actual evidence for the stories that we tell, we have only tiny little fragments. There's very little that we can say, I think, with confidence 
about how the earliest Christian beliefs emerged. Certainly, there are certain things which are, essen are essential components, like the resurrection. I wouldn't say the resurrection actually materially contributes to Christology in, 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 the, in some ways that have been suggested. Certainly, the resurrection is a, a condition without which there would be no Christology, as Bart said earlier. But I, I'm a bit skeptical about the various stories that we tell about how Jesus became God. My exhortation would be that rather than focusing on the how question, that we should focus on what the New Testament proclaims about uh, who Jesus is. The what question rather than the how question, I suppose. In theological terms, that's, that's what materially relates to the gospel. You, know, you, you don't get saved by <laughs> a particular view of the of Christological origins or whatever. But uh, the, the question that I think Mike or Jennifer mentioned earlier, the question that presents itself to every generation, who do you say that I am? That is the, the key Christological question. But I want to end with an exhortation. It may not be that every Christian needs a robust theology. A lot of people just go through their lives believing, happily, going to church, doing whatever it is they do to make their Christian life a good Christian life. But I have come to believe that a lot more people could use a good theology to back up their faith. Sometimes I think people lose their faith because they don't know how to think theologically very, in a very sophisticated way. I would urge you, besides learning how to do good historiography from a modern point of view, which I do think is important for biblical studies in our day and age, but even more so, I would urge you to try to learn how to do theology. What does it mean to think theologically as a Christian? What does it mean to interpret the Bible theologically as a Christian? And that means reading theology actual theologians. It means studying the history of theology. And in order to do that, let me also urge you, as scary as it sounds, sometimes good philosophy is the support of good theology. A good philosophy of language, a good philosophy of knowledge. All of these things can be used to support faith. But too many Christians in our day and age just either don't feel the need for them, and that's fine if they don't feel the need for them, but they don't think they're important. They think just believing is important but I would urge you to learn how to do good theology. And finally, a statement by Dr. Michael Byrd. I believe Jesus acted with a sense of unmediated authority. I believe he uh, cited passages like Psalm 110 and combined an Aramaic idiom of self-reference with reference to uh, the Son of Man from Daniel 7 that made himself out to be one of God's main agents in the eschatological kingdom that was dawning, that in and through him God was becoming king. The new exodus of Isaiah was happening. The great moment of liberation and redemption was underway. He spoke in such a way as the line between divine agent and divine sender was somewhat blurred. But it was with the resurrection and with belief in his exaltation that he was regarded as being enthroned and installed as Yahweh's vice regent. And I think this is where it's get a little bit unsure. We're in that tunnel period that Simon spoke about. But I think there were some moments of retrojection because they thought, well, if Jesus has been ascended, maybe he then descended in the first place. If he is the firstborn from among the dead, then maybe he's also the firstborn of all creation. If he has been given all authority in heaven and earth, maybe he always had that authority. If he uh, was crucified for our sins, then maybe he is the lamb who was slain before the foundation of the world. And I think it's through inferences like that where we see the genesis of Christology, both diverse and developing, but something along that kind of action taking place. But as I said, the most important question you can get out of this forum, the most important thing you can ask is to answer Jesus' own question, who do you say I am? What does Dr. Bird mean when he says that Jesus acts with a sense of unmediated authority in the Gospels? Unmediated. In other words, he has a direct connection to God? Or does he mean to say, with a sense of unoriginated authority, like with the consciousness that he's God and that he didn't get his authority from another? I'm not sure if that's what he means, but if it is, in the Gospels, Jesus explicitly says that his teaching and his power and his mission come from God. So he has those things derivatively. It is presupposed, I think, that he has an unmediated relationship with God. He's God's unique son and is sinless 
and enjoys a unique fellowship and communion with God, which is not mediated by another, to say that the Gospels blur the line between the sender and the sent one is honestly, I think, projecting one's own confusion onto the sources. The sources don't say that Jesus is someone other than God, and then also imply that he's the same one as God. No, they're two. Jesus prays to him. God speaks back to him. Jesus doesn't want to be crucified, but God insists on his will being done, and then Jesus agrees with that. There's no confusion there. Jesus is God's Messiah in all four of the Gospels. That's the New Testament. God has raised him. God has exalted him. God has put him in a position where he ought to be worshipped to the glory of God. God has given Jesus his message. God has empowered him to heal. God has empowered him to forgive sins. There's a high and mighty authority there. Jesus is the kurios. But this is in contrast to the one God. As Paul says in 1 Corinthians 8, Paul is saying that we Christians believe in one God. Who's that? The Father. Oh, and we also believe in one Lord. About this, he was exalted, therefore he must have pre-existed. This seems not to follow. This doesn't seem like a valid argument to me. I guess we need some extra premise here to connect the first premise and the conclusion. I agree with Dr. Gathercole and with Dr. Bird that whatever we say about historical questions, it is urgent that we should answer Jesus' question to his disciples, Who do you say I am? Happily, these sources straight up tell us what the correct answer to that question is. You are the Christ. You are the Messiah. It's not necessary, according to the New Testament, to answer God or God and not God, or God and man, or one person with two natures. In the Gospels and in Acts and elsewhere in the New Testament, the confession is that Jesus is Lord, the risen Lord Messiah, the second Lord, referred to as my Lord in Psalm 110. With that, we end this episode If I misunderstood any of the speakers, I apologize in advance. I'll correct myself in a future episode if anyone contacts me and lets me know that I horribly misinterpreted them. Be sure to check out the Greer Herd Point Counterpoint Forum website. It's at greerherd.com. That is Greer, G-R-E-E-R, and then the same word, Herd, H-E-A-R-D, just like you heard good news, greerherd.com. You can see information there about all the speakers and even about their upcoming 2017 Point Counterpoint Forum. Today's thinking music has been the track A Human Being by Andy G. Cohen. Check out his website, which is andyg.co. Do you enjoy listening to the Trinity's podcast? There are four ways you can show us some love in return. First, share the blog post for this episode on whatever social media you use. Second, you can leave us a rating and a brief review in the iTunes store and at Stitcher. Doing this will help other people who are interested in theology to find this podcast. Third, you can donate to the cause by clicking the orange donate buttons to the right of any blog post. Fourth, you can send us some brief, to-the-point audio feedback for possible incorporation into a future episode. We would love to hear your question or your comment in your voice. The upload link for your audio file is on the blog post for any episode. To sum up, you can share, rate, donate, and talk back. Thanks for listening. We'll see you online at trinities.org. Till next time, don't forget to love God with all your mind.